morning. And if you would, take your Bible, turn over to Genesis chapter 1. If you wonder where Genesis is, it's the very first book in the Bible. Easy to find. And we're even going to be talking about chapter 1. I want to talk a little bit about our big mouth. <laughs> Say that out loud, my big mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at your neighbor say, did you know you have a big mouth? <laughs> um, you know, the Bible talks about in James chapter 3, it talks about and it compares our tongue to a rudder on a ship. And it says that even though a ship is very large and it's tossed by the wind, it is directed by this little small thing called a rudder. And, and, the, and James, make, he talks about that and, and he connects it to the tongue of our mouth. In other words, he's saying that your declaration becomes your destination. Can I get an amen? The things that you say matter in your life. And, and many of us can go back and we can look at teachers or mentors, people in our lives that we respected that said things that inspired us, encouraged us, caused us, caused us not to give up. You know, these are people that said things that, that even we wrote down and you can probably quote one of your favorite mentors, maybe somebody that said something that impacted your life. That is the power of words. My wife and I, on, our birthday, on my birthday, bought a house, praise God, or we, or we made an offer on a house, and they accepted the contract, but I've signed those documents before. And man, and what are those documents? What's on those documents? It's words. We do, everything in our life is connected to words. And so we have a mouthful of words. On Tuesday night, we had something else funny happen that our, our dog started barking very loudly and I ran outside because it was not the normal bark. And they were all the way in the corner of our yard and, and our small one was back about six feet and he was barking, 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 barking. And then our bigger one was right in the corner and he had his foot on whatever animal was in the corner. And so I went over there to see what in the world is going on because we have possums in our yard frequently. And so I thought, well, maybe it's a possum. And then I smelled this odor, odor, <laughs> and this odor, and it was a skunk. <laughs> then I saw him, and I went, oh, dear God. I mean, how do I get my dog away from this dude? I, wasn't, I didn't want to get sprayed. I, you know, I've heard horror stories of how long that stench lasts and remains. And so our big dog, he just thinks this is his toy. And so, he's, so now he's got, he puts his mouth down to get a bite and this skunk sprays him. He got a mouthful. Oh, man. And then he backs up, of course. And so, you know, he's like, oh. <laughs> so how many of you know there's things that don't belong in your mouth? <laughs> uh, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to be ordering one of those ozone machines because there's a couple rooms in our house that I just want to, I'm going to do my best because there's still an odor, you know, in there. So have you found Genesis chapter one yet? Okay, well, before I read Genesis chapter one, Proverbs 18 says this. It says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. So there's a power that's in our mouth that equates to either life or death. Most of the time, it's not for other people. Most of the time, it's us. And so you're there in Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, look at verse 26. God says this in Genesis 1, 26. He says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have dominion. So I enjoy it when people show me family pictures because I like seeing, uh, you know, kid, children that look like their parents. In fact, true story, when Zach was born, the doctor looked at Nicole and I and he said, where's this kid from? Because he doesn't look like either of you. And it's true, it was later that he started looking like us. But I enjoy looking at those because the child is supposed to look like the parents. They have the parents' DNA. Well, the child doesn't only look like the parents, he walks like, they walk like the parents, they talk like the parents, right? So when we 
received Jesus, when we surrendered our life to him, we became his child, his offspring. So now we are supposed to look like him. We're supposed to walk like him and we're supposed to talk like him. Yeah, my mom added thank like him. I like it. I'll take it. Thank like him. So you're there in Genesis chapter one. I want you to notice something in that chapter. Genesis chapter one. Look at verse three. The first three words in verse three is, then God said, let there be light. And then in verse five, he said, and God called the light day, called the night or the darkness night. And in verse six, it says, and then God said. And in verse eight, it says, and then God called. Verse nine, it says, then God said. Verse 10 says, and then God called. Are you seeing some consistency going on here in Genesis chapter one? And God said, God spoke. How did he create? With his words first. He spoke it into existence. Now we know that he formed us from the dust of the ground. So there was other action involved, but he spoke it first, didn't he? And so you're his child. Now, another interesting verse, look at chapter two, look at verse 19. This is really interesting. So God creates everything. He creates the earth. He creates the cattle. He creates uh, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air. And then look at what he does in verse 19. It says, out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Interesting. So God created them, but Adam called them. I like what uh, Robert Morris said. He was talking about when God did this, when he brought the animals to Adam and had him name him. He said, I think he got a little exhausted during the naming process because, you know, he got down to the birds and he was saying, yeah, red bird, black bird, blue bird. I mean, you know, just got tired <laughs> of it. I like that. But so, so God created them, Adam called them. What is God showing Adam? He's showing Adam that the things will become what you call them. Now, turn over to Mark chapter 11. I want to show you this in another place. We're going to get a little detailed here this morning, so I hope you're prepared. You brought your flip, your thumb to flip the pages on the Bible, right? Or on your phone, whatever Bible is your preference. Mark 11, look at 22. Because I want you to see that Jesus said this. Now, you remember Jesus, he went over to the fig tree one morning because he was hungry to see if he could get something to eat. There were leaves on it already. It was already starting to bud. He thought maybe there's leaves, uh, figs on there. He didn't find any. He said, he cursed the tree, right? And then he went into the temple, did some things. The next day when they were coming back, Peter saw the tree and he saw that it had withered. He said, Lord, look at the tree that you cursed. It's withered away from the roots. And then Jesus made this statement. He said in verse 22, have faith in God. He said, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, whoever does what to the mountain? Why would you talk to a mountain? (laughs) Whoever says, I'm going to leave that right there for effect. All right. So whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now, a couple weeks ago, we learned about that word mountain. You remember I used the same scripture. Mountain, if you look it up in the Greek, it's a mountain as lifting itself above the plain. How many mountains have you seen that lift themselves up? This is a problem, this is a circumstance, this is a challenge, this is something that can rise itself above the plane. And what's the purpose of a mountain rising, raising itself above the plane? Is to block the view, is to put a barrier between you and your destination, between you and what you wanna see in God. So you heard the phrase, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. How do you make a mountain a mole, uh, out of a molehill? You speak it. You talk about it. Come on, we proved this out with COVID-19. All the science of COVID-19 is that it's not nearly as bad as other pandemics that we never even said anything about, right? But what did you hear all last year? Come on, we've just gotten past the 
anniversary, and I don't know why you would celebrate that, but it's been a year, all right? And, and what was talked about all last year, more than anything, pandemic, 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 COVID-19, COVID-19, COVID. Well, before COVID, my life was great before COVID. I want to get back to president at times. I'm done living in unprecedented times. Everybody has something to say about COVID. Now, turn over to Matthew 6, right? You were in Mark, Matthew chapter 6. This is very interesting to me when I read this. I, I'm going to read it to you out of the King James. It says in verse 31, therefore, take no thought saying. This is an interesting statement. This is Jesus talking. It's in red, so you know it's important. So Jesus says, take no thought saying. That statement means that thoughts are something that, that you take, you receive once you speak them out. Now you're giving life to thoughts. Does that make sense? Now, let me read it to you out of the New King James. New King James says, therefore, do not worry. So taking thought is the same as worrying. How do you worry anyway? You sit around and you think about all the possibilities, all the what ifs. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this goes on? So, so my question to you this morning is, are you calling, are you growing your mountain? Or are you calling things that be not as, as though they are? Well, let's read that scripture. That's over in Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. And I want, you to, I want you to be able to see this with me. Romans chapter four says, God who gives life to the dead and calls things that do not exist as though they did. So we saw that in Genesis. We saw that there was no light. God said, let there be light and there was light. Light came on, right? And so this is interesting. I want to read to you a scripture out of Proverbs. Thing is more appealing than speaking beautiful, life-giving words. Isn't that amazing? That, that your mouth can be so filled with grace that it's like uh, settings of uh, apples of gold and settings of silver, that it's pleasant, that it's, it's graceful, that it builds up and it encourages people. So we have that ability as a human to speak good things and that affects people. I, you know, I love it when people give me a compliment. How many of you like compliments? People give you a compliment. Why? Because it's encouraging to you. Thank you. I'm glad I wore this today. You know, or whatever it is, you know, you have straight teeth. Great. So anyway, so here's where I'm going with that is that God wants us to learn how to call things that be not as though they are. Let me prove that to you. Go over to Ezekiel. Now, you might have to go to the table of contents, but it's, it's going to be all right. Ezekiel 37. And look at verse 4. You remember Ezekiel was having this vision, and he saw all of these dry bones, human bones, laying out in this field, right? Well, God spoke to him, spoke to his heart, and he said to him in verse 4, he said, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, why would God want Ezekiel to speak to the bones? Why not get a broom and a dustpan and do something with it? Ezekiel is stepping out on what God told him to do. Now, this is, this is different. So now turn over to Ephesians 6. I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere, so hang in there. This, uh, this message has an odd title. <laughs> the title is You Call It. So I think, I think you'll understand as we keep going. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, you know that this talks about the armor, right? And this is, this is a very well-known verse. In, in verse 10, it says, To be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, not part of it. Put it all on. And then it says, so that you can stand against the wiles or the schemes or the strategy or the plan of the enemy, right? Because our fight is not against our boss, our spouse, our relative, anybody else that we know. Our fight is against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age. <laughs> our battle is against Satan and hell itself. Let's just say it that way. Right? And so he says, so I'm going to give you some things to fight with. Now notice, he says down in verse 14, he says, I'm going to give you a belt of truth. 
right? I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a breastplate of righteousness. I'm gonna give you shoes that are peaceful shoes. You're gonna go out with joy. You're gonna be led forth with peace, right? And then he said, I'm going to give you a shield of faith so that you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And then I'm gonna give you the helmet of salvation. Interesting, all of this armor leading up to this point is defensive or protective. But then he says this, but now I'm gonna give you the sword of the spirit to fight with. A, a sword that you doesn't stay in the sheath, it comes out. And you use it. And what is the sword of the spirit? It's the word of God. Huh. So the weapon of the spirit is the word of God. Now, the word of God is what he's already said, his promises. Anything that he said in this Bible, Old Covenant, New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament, you can take and you can use as a sword. You've heard people refer to the Bible as the sword, right? This is my sword. You got anything? I like what Todd White said. He said, you got anything sharp in that bag when he was traveling? He said, oh, yeah, it's very sharp. And then he pulled out his Bible. Okay, it's the sword, right? Okay, so, so that's the sword. Now, think about this. So God's promises are greater than the report that we're facing. Think about Caleb. When Caleb came back and all the spies and they spied out the promised land and all the spies uh, other, besides he and Joshua said, we can't go in, we are not able to take the promised land. And Daniel, I'm sure Daniel was thinking, I am not able to race, I may not be able to race this year. He races those street bikes, not the dirt bikes. This is, these are the fast street bikes. And uh, man, I still haven't been able to go to a race. He hasn't had one close enough that's not on a weekend. But anyway, and I want to go. But, he, but anyway, but, so Caleb, instead of believing the report, what does he do? Caleb remembered the promise that God gave them this land. God has given us this land. So, so what does Caleb do? Caleb aligns his tongue with the promise of God. Come on, some, people, some of us need some tongue alignment. Get that thing the way it needs to be. And what does he say? He says, let us go at once because we are well able to take possession of the land. What would cause David to look at Goliath and say, you may come to me with a spear, with a javelin and a sword, but I come to you in the mighty name of the Lord of hosts. Why would he say that? Because he understands that the promise is greater than Goliath's strength. Mm, man, tongue alignment. That's what we need. Now turn over to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, I told you there was going to be some scripture this morning. I warned you. Now, this is God talking in Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet. He's a man of God that God uses. And the Lord says in verse 11, he says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty but it shall accomplish what I please and it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Well, wow, we saw that back in Genesis. God said, let there be, and there was. It came on, it happened. It was created. Where are you going with this, Pastor Phil? Because God's word in the mouth of a believer produces God results. There's been, there's been a little misconception with the power of words. You know, and like anything, you know, things can get taught a little goofy, I think. Um, and maybe misconceptions can happen. You know, and, and I think sometimes it became all about confession. Confession, 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 confession. You guys remember that back, back in, I remember back in the charismatic movement, you know, that it was all about confession. Confess this, confess this. You know, well, <laughs> you can confess 3,050 times that I have a Ferrari in my garage, but it will not put a Ferrari in your garage. Why? You're going to have to go do something. You're going to have to go out and put feet 
to faith. So I'm not talking about a formula here. What I'm talking about is us as Christians aligning our tongue to what God said. And when I, ha- when I can stand on God's word and I can say what he says as a believer, then it will produce in my life. All right. Well, let me tell you what Jesus said about that. Go over to John 12. John 12. Don't hurt me. I'm just the messenger on this deal, okay? John 12. Look at verse 20, 49. It says, now this is Jesus speaking. And because it, again, it's in red. And he says, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me gave me a command, what I should speak and what I should say. Huh. So if Jesus speaks only what the father tells him to speak, who am I to rattle off my lips and just say any old thing that comes to mind? Why wouldn't I put, why wouldn't I put the word of God in my heart and in my mouth so that when I'm facing a situation, I could speak his word instead of my opinion over it? Hmm. Well, Phil, are you saying that what I, what I say can, can draw to me what, you know, what I want? What I'm saying is it's like an elevator. Next time you're on an elevator, don't push a button and see where it takes you. See if you get to your desired destination anytime soon. Somebody else gets on. We're going to stop at every floor. <laughs> you have to push a button. You guys, okay, so we're, we're switching from winter to summer. It's kind of springish, right? Now, let's say it was really hot in here. Let's say it was midsummer already, 100 degrees outside or close, 90s, right? And in here, uh, I know where the thermostat is, but you guys are all burning up and sweating. Would you be happy with me? The answer is no. Just, okay, because some of you would be nice. <laughs> Some of you would just leave, right? But, but if I know where the thermostat is, then I can go and set the thermostat. Does, it, does the temperature change immediately? Does it? Does it go from 90 to 70 instantaneously? No. Why? I set where I want it to go. This is the power of our words, is when we speak God's word, we are speaking the desired destination. In fact, he said in Joel 3.10, he said, hey, if you're weak, if you're feeling weak physically, you can speak Joel 3.10, which says, let the weak say, I am strong and strength will begin to come to you. So you see, now I'm not speaking words in redundancy and in some kind of form of confession, but I'm speaking words because I believe the promise of God. And I believe that if I say, let the weak say I'm strong and God gave me that command that I can say, Lord, I thank you in Jesus name that I am strong. I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I thank you, Lord, that even though I feel weak on the outside, that just like that thermostat, the temperature has to get to that desired place, then my health will get to that desired place. Come on, the Bible says that these signs will follow those who believe, will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Miracles are amazing. Instantaneous miracles, I've seen them and I believe them and I believe for them. I love seeing instantaneous miracles, but I'll tell you what I've seen more, recovery over time. What have you been speaking over your circumstances? What would it be like if you began to talk differently about your job and about your boss and about your coworkers? What would it be like if the only thing that came out of your mouth was I love where I work? I love the people that I work with. God has given me such a heart of love for my boss. And I know sometimes he has grumpy days, but I know other people do. But you know what? I choose to walk in love and I choose to not say anything negative. What would it be like if you begin to talk about your spouse that way? Man, you begin to say good things about your spouse instead of talking about divorce constantly, talking about she, you do this and you do that and you never and you always. 
What would it be like if you began to speak differently about your situation? What if you begin to speak differently about your neighbor that lives next to you? Put a big no trespassing sign right on the top of the tree above your fence. We had a neighbor do that. We did. We had Zach. Zach brought home this. He brought home this. Uh, what, what are they called, Zach? Hammock. And uh, he was going to lay, you know, he was, it's, but we only have one tree in our backyard. So what's he going to fasten the other end to? Well, there's another tree, but it's over the fence. It's just over the fence. You can reach out and touch it. So what did we do? We, you know, we put a ratchet strap around that thing and we hooked it to his hammock. And then we put the other end to, to the tree. Well, it stayed there all summer, didn't it? And our neighbor came over and he cut it. And cut it off. And then he put a big no trespassing sign. Come over to my house. I'll show you. Show it to you. So I had an opportunity. How are you? I'm only telling you that story to say, to, I didn't go and beat on his door, guys. I didn't go over there and say, dude, what's up? I mean, that's kind of mean. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't go over and have a conversation with him. I didn't rear my back and say, oh, it's on. It's on. Oh, that'll go real well. Now you're totally, now you're fighting a human, oh my word, it's just not going to be pretty. But you know how many people do that? With their neighbor. When it says in Proverbs, don't do that to your neighbor, why would you fight your neighbor? Wouldn't you want to live at peace? Okay, I'm off subject. Okay, let me get back. Joshua, turn over to Joshua chapter one. Okay, think about this. God made a covenant with who in the, in the Old Testament? Abraham, thank you. Abram was his name prior. Abram means exalted father. But what did God do when he made a covenant with him? He said, look, I'm gonna change your name. Your name is gonna, no, thank you. No, it helps good. You're no longer gonna be called Abram. You're gonna be called Abraham. And what does that mean, Rudy? It means father of many nations, doesn't it? From exalted father to father of many nations. Now think about this. When God changed his name, did he magically have hundreds of kids? Did, did Sarah suddenly, boom, 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 every nine months, pop out some babies? No. No, it was years later. So nothing changed, but his name changed and what people called him. So the, here's the interesting thing. When people came up and they said, Abraham, I have a question for you. What are they doing? He just called me the father of many nations. Thank you, Abraham, father of many nations. Phil, you know what Phil means? Love. Philadelphia, right? City of brotherly love, where my wife was born, Philadelphia. So so we're, she's a Philly, man. Come on. <laughs> and, uh, but so I, so I get to live up to my name. I get to walk in love. I get to live in love with people. Okay, he found Joshua 1 8. Joshua chapter 1. Look at verse 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall be constantly in or shall meditate in it day and night night that you, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have what? Good success. Good success. How many of you want to be successful? Yes. Notice it said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. That means that it's always in there. That means that that you feed on the word so much that it bypasses your brain, gets down on the inside of you. And then when you're faced with the situation, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, instead of saying, well, you're blankety blank and, and waving at them with one finger, you decide, no, Lord bless him. I pray for him. I don't know what's going on in his life, but God, I pray for that guy. I pray for that young lady. All right. So why should we meditate day and night on his promises? 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God are yes and amen. Man, I, I sold a car just recently and the guy that bought it lived about an hour away. And so he said, I tell you what, I will buy your car if you can guarantee 
that I'm going to make it all the way back to my hometown. And I just said, I said, sir, I wouldn't guarantee that if it was a 2021 car. Because I, I, I don't know what you're going to hit or deer. I mean, I don't, a lot of things can happen between here and home. He wanted a guarantee. So I told him, I said, well, I can't tell you this. My, my daughter drives every other weekend to Tulsa to see a, a nice guy friend. And, and, and he goes, oh, well, that gives, me, that gives me a lot more confidence then. I was like, and she does it every weekend. So anyway, but look at this guarantee. All the promises of God are what? All the promises of God are maybe? Are they sometime? Oh, come on, once in a while. All the promises of God are yes and amen. And then here's the second part. Here's the second reason you want to meditate on the word of God is because God's word mixed with faith produces results. Come on. I'm telling you, this, this is not a formula, guys. This is not a get rich quick scheme. It doesn't work like that. All right? I'm not up here preaching that you can say something long enough, and, and suddenly you're going to have that thing. There's, there's millions of people sitting around today on rocking chairs on their front porch saying, I wish I had a million dollars. I wish I had a million dollars. One day my ship will come in. Not if you didn't send one out, it won't come back. I mean, <laughs> that's a cruise ship in the harbor. That's not your ship coming in, man. <laughs> right? This is not a formula. This is kingdom culture. The language, it's a part of the language of heaven. Putting God's words in our mouth, in our heart, so that we can speak it over situations. When my mom experienced a massive heart attack back in 2011, I carried her, to, I literally picked her up, put her in the car, and as we were driving to the hospital, I didn't know it at the time, but she's having congestive heart failure, which means your lungs are filling with fluid, which basically means that you're drowning. And she was, you know, she was struggling to get a breath. And I didn't know what was going on. I am not medically trained. I don't know what means, you know, but I do know this, that I began, I said, I was in the back seat, she was in the front, my dad's driving. I said, mom, I want you to repeat after me. And she said, okay. I said, say this, mom, Joel 3.10 says, Joel 3.10 says, I said, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let me tell you, by the time it was a 15-minute drive from our house to Baptist East. By the time we got to the hospital, mom was talking as strong as I'm talking to you right now. I said, mom, say Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, man. Do you, are you starting to see the importance of putting the word of God in you so that you have it when you need it? And you're not scrambling. Oh, scr wait, okay, where's my Bible? Anybody see my Bible? That's not anybody here. What happened when Daniel and his friends were taken from Israel and brought to Babylon? Well, one of the first things that they did was they taught him the Babylonian language. Taught him a new language. So their plan is we want to get Israel out of these guys and get Babylon into them. And they renamed them. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Did you know that's a woman's name? That's real flattering. And so, so anyway, so I don't want to get off track. But <clears throat> here's the point. Is that we need to unlearn the culture of flesh and worry and doubt and unbelief. And we need to learn the culture of kingdom culture heaven speech, heaven talk, God talk, and get that on the inside of us. Let me read to you finally in closing in Romans uh, chapter 10. Go ahead and come on, Rebecca. 
Romans chapter 10, look at verse 17. This is a familiar verse as well. It says, faith then is birthed in the heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the anointed one. In fact, New King James says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? By the word of God. Now, let me give you a practical way to get the word of God out of the Bible and into the depths of your heart. Everybody on their phone has some kind of notepad. If you have an iPhone, it looks like that. If you don't, it doesn't look like that. It looks like whatever yours looks like. <laughs> but, but, but everybody has a notepad. And so in my notepad, you'll see different titles here. I've got, I've got scriptures on anxiety, scriptures on healing, scriptures on dealing with guilt, shame, condemnation, scriptures on offense, scriptures on being easily irritated, scriptures on the mind and memory. Come on, I just turned 54 and, and I thank you, Lord, that I had the mind of Christ, that I remember stuff. He said to remember things of old. Deuteronomy 111 says, may the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he promised you. Now I have something to stand on. Now I could take the scripture and bring it before God and say, God, we're dealing with finance. We have a financial situation going on. I'm standing on your scripture, Lord, that you would bless me as you promised. And so I'm asking you, what is the answer? Help me break free. When Nicole and I prayed that prayer, let me tell you, when we first got married, 1992, Phoenix, Arizona, I had a job working minimum wage. Do you know what the minimum wage was? In 1992, it was $4.25 an hour. Come on, somebody. You can't even buy a banana on that salary. But man, I was working, and I was working 40-hour week, every week. All I knew was I was married, I have an apartment, I have a new wife, and God, you're gonna have to help me figure out how to be the provider that you have called me to be. And so you know what I did? I took my Bible to work every day. And while we were there, the phone rings and it's for me. We don't have cells back then. There was no cell phones back then. They had to locate the restaurant, call the restaurant and get the waiter to come and get me. And I went, who in the world is calling me? I don't even know anybody in Phoenix. I have only lived here for a few months. And so I get on the phone and it's a guy from the church, uh, parent, Nicole's parents' church at the time, Norval Wildman, I'll never forget him. And he said, Phil, he said, listen, I, I have a proposition for you. I said, well, what is it? And he said, how would you like to come work at the post office? I said, you mean throwing mail? And he said, yeah. He said, listen, I, I, I've got a contract with the post office and I just, they just awarded another contract to me, but it's a lot bigger route. And he said, I'm an older guy. I like my other route and it's easy for me to do. He said, but this one's bigger. I need a young guy that can do it. He said, he said, he said and I'm sorry, it only pays 500 a week. I said, oh dear Jesus, thank you Lord. Because <laughs> we didn't have any money. But see, when I married Nicole, uh, she married me in all of my debts. I was a musician. One day I was going to be somebody. I don't know what I was going to do. But, but I had borrowed this money and bought all of this equipment. Back then they had the Mac Classic, which looked like a, a big brick or whatever it was, you know, big center block, you know, and, and I had a keyboard and something else, just some pieces of equipment. And so when she married me, she married all that debt and we were praying, Lord, if you'll show us how, I'll get out of debt and I won't, I won't borrow. And do you know, we got out of debt within a year that God blessed me with that job. And in fact, when I resigned my $4.25 an hour job, my manager said, hey, can you get me a job over at the post office? <laughs> Stand up with me, would you? 